Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first OpenSIM webinar. We're excited to have over 100 participants for our first webinar from around the world. Uh, my name is Jennifer Hicks. I'm the OpenSIM project manager at Stanford, and I'll be serving as the moderator for the webinar today. Today's presenter, Sam Hamner, is going to describe how to create and analyze muscle-driven simulations of human running. Uh, OpenSim is a freely available software package for biomechanical simulation that's used by research teams around the world. The first goal of our webinar series is to showcase this cutting-edge research. Our speakers will also provide insights on how they use OpenSim in their research process. With the webinar series, we also hope to provide an easy platform for OpenSim users to communicate and collaborate since we have a growing and geographically diverse user base. Before we get started, I have a few reminders about the webinar format. Questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. You'll have two options for asking questions. You can type a question in the Q&A panel found on the bottom right of the WebEx panel, or you can use the audio if you have a functioning microphone. If you need any more help, you can also consult the guide that we emailed you, uh, which is also available at the link at the bottom of the slide. And with that, I would now like to introduce Sam Hamner. Uh, Sam is a graduate student in mechanical engineering here at Stanford. Uh, he's an expert OpenSIM user who's developed muscle-actuated dynamic simulations of running, a project he'll discuss with you now. Uh, here's Sam. Thanks, Jen. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, like Jen said, my name's Sam, and I'd like to welcome you all to this first in a series of webinars that will highlight research using OpenSIM. Today I'm going to discuss work that I've done with my colleagues, AJ Seth and Scott Delp, to create a three-dimensional muscle-driven simulation of the running gait cycle and the analysis we performed to gain insight into running dynamics. I'll talk about how we used OpenSim to create simulations that complement what we can learn from experimental data collected in the lab. In particular, I'll show you how we estimate muscle forces, which is something we usually can't measure. But before we dive into the presentation, we're going to start off with a quick uh, interactive poll to kind of get an understanding of who's uh, joining us in the webinar today. So the question is, uh, what is your background? Um, and if you, fit in, if you fit into one of these buckets, we have kinesiology, physiology, sports science, biomechanics, mechanical engineering, bioengineering, biology and animal sciences, uh, physical therapy, rehabilitation, robotics, computer science or other. And if you're another, uh, if you don't mind filling out the uh, specifying what your other is uh, when you answer the question, that'd be great. So I'm C. Give a few more seconds for everybody to uh, answer the poll. And I'm sure some of you probably fit in multiple buckets, so just pick whichever one's your favorite. All right, Cisco is, our WebEx is crunching away and analyzing all of the participants' answers to come up with real-time whole answers. Oh, and there we go, wow. So engineers, we have a bunch of engineers watching today, biomechanical, bioengineers. And then uh, so, uh, the next biggest group looks like kinesiology, sports science. That's cool. All right. So we'll have a couple more of these interactive polls as we go through the uh, rest of the webinar. So to give you a preview of where we're going to go, uh, kind of the track we're going to take during the webinar, is first we'll talk about um, how we de develop a scientific research question uh, when we're doing a simulation study. We'll talk about how you, de how you design an experiment to uh, perform a simulation study. We'll talk about how, we use, how I use the OpenSim workflow, which includes the scale tool, inverse kinematics, residual reduction algorithm, and computed muscle control. We'll talk about how you can test your simulation to gain confidence in the results. And then we'll talk about how you can analyze your simulation to get, 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 gain something interesting or answer uh, a question. We'll talk about the induced acceleration analysis, perturbation analysis, 
and how you can create your own custom analyses using OpenSIM plugins. Okay, so before we dive into creating our simulation or even collecting our data, I think it's very important that we start with a clear question that we would like to answer using a simulation. Now, I'm not going to try to teach all of you guys how to come up with compelling research questions. I mean, I'm sure all of you have lots of interesting questions already that you'd like to answer, but I do think it's important to start here first, not only so that we can write compelling papers and grants, but by having a clear question, you can start to make decisions on what experiments you, you'll need to perform, how simple or complex your model needs to be, where it's okay to make assumptions about properties in your model and where you need to be really accurate, and which simulation methods you're going to use. So for example, today we're going to discuss a question I've been working on over the past couple of years is, which is, how do muscles contribute to propulsion and support of the body mass center during running? And in particular, we're going to define propulsion as the forward acceleration of the body mass center. And we'll define support as the vertical acceleration of the body mass center. Okay, so I'm going to jump ahead and give you guys a sneak preview kind of, of what, we're, what we're looking for. So these figures are what we call butterfly plots, and they do a nice job of visually showing us the direction and magnitude of the mass center acceleration during the stance phase of running. Each vector ray uses the resultant of the fore aft and vertical acceleration of the mass center. The gray rays in each graph represent the total or net mass center acceleration as measured in the lab, while the red lines show the estimated contributions of individual muscles of the mass center. So if you look at if you look at the plot on the top left, you can see the rays at the beginning of stance phase are pointed up and to the left, which means which means that the the uh, mass center is accelerating backwards, or we're breaking uh, when the foot comes into contact with the ground. And in the later half of stance, these vectors are up and to the right, and this is when the mass center starts to accelerate forward in late stance uh, and into toe off. So these red the, these red lines, which represent the muscle contributions, are what we're going to be what we're trying to uh, we're trying to get or get at. Okay, so before we start creating our simulation, though, we need to make we need to make some measurements. When collecting data to create mus muscle-driven simulations of any movement, there are certain data that is essential, like body kinematics. But we also need to think about what other measurements may be important to help us answer our question. So, what data is essential when creating a muscle-driven simulation of running or any movement, for that matter? First, it's kinematics or body motion, which we typically measure with a motion capture system. We also need to measure ground reaction forces, which we usually measure with force plates. And if we're going to be simulating any motion where there's interaction between the subject and the device, like a, with a walker or a cane or something, we, we also need to measure those forces. And then particularly for muscle-driven simulations, we collect EMG data, which is, uh, which is very good so that we can compare these experimental recordings with the simulated muscle activations that we're going to generate later. Some tips I've picked up along the way that help, can help make your life easier when you're collecting data for a simulation are first and foremost, establish a lab protocol. Consistency in marker sets, lab coordinate systems, camera placement, placement and so on can make everything much more efficient and make your students' lives a lot easier. <laughs> Take lots of pictures and video during collection, especially during the static trial. And I'll, I'll talk about why the static trial is uh, most important, but during all, all of your data collection, it's a good idea to take pictures or video. And then finally, um, measure as many subject specifics as possible. Measure their height, their weight, segment lengths. If you have a Biodex machine, measure their strength. All of this can be incorporated into your model later. Okay, so we have, we have another poll question now. I'm interested in, in learning a bit about how you guys collect your data. So the question is, what is your primary means of getting experimental data? A, you collect it yourself. B you have students or employees collect it for you. C, you, have, you get your data from collaborators. D, you find your data online, like from a simtk.org project. Or D, you don't use experimental data.
All right, awesome. So it looks like about half of you say that you collect your own data. 10% of you, are, I guess, are professors or, <laughs> or CEOs, and you have your students and empl or employees collect your data. And then uh, we have a couple people who don't use, don't use experimental data. They probably are creating um, simulations from using control strategies or something. Okay. Okay, so we've collected data and we've processed it. We've gotten somebody else to do it for us if we're, if we're smart. And we're finally, uh, we're finally uh, ready to start using the tools in OpenSim to create our subject-specific simulation of movement. Now I'm going to quickly go through the workflow that we use for this simulation, and then I'll talk about each tool uh, a little bit more in depth. So the first step in the workflow is scale. And this is where we take a generic musculoskeletal model and scale it up to match the subject's measured size and mass, or scale it down if they're small subjects. Our next step is inverse kinematics, or IK, where we use the scaled model to calculate the model's joint angles that best track the motion of the markers that we measured on our subject. After IK, we use residual, what we call the residual reduction algorithm, or RRA, to calculate the joint moments for the measured motion. But instead of calculating moments with traditional inverse dynamics, we also use an optimization algorithm that that improves the dynamic consistency of the simulation by slightly adjusting joint angles and model mass properties. And I'll go in more depth about what that means in a second. And finally, once we have a torque-driven motion from RRA, we feed those results into a tool called Computed Muscle Control, or CMC, to estimate muscle activations and forces. CMC uses a static optimization in conjunction with a, a PD, or proportional derivative controller, to determine a set of muscle activations and forces that will closely track the measured motion. And again, I'll go into more detail about this tool in a minute. In a minute. All right, so let's take a second to have a closer look at each of these tools. We'll start with the scale tool. Here I'm showing you a snapshot of the OpenSim GUI after I've scaled a model. So on the left here, I'm gonna circle it, we have our generic musculoskeletal model with a, uh, with a virtual marker set. If you look really close, you can see that there's little markers around that, around that model. These virtual markers are a set of markers that we've, we've built in the GUI that correspond to the experimental marker set that we established in our lab. Scale factors for each of the body segments are then determined using the data from markers that we specify in the tool. We usually specify um, markers that are placed on bony landmarks that we can identify both easily identify both on our subject when we're doing the experiment and also can identify on the model. Scaling the model might seem like a simple step, but it's probably the most important step in the workflow. If you don't have an accurately scaled model, you're going to, we're going to struggle to get good results in subsequent steps, especially in um, RRA and CMC. So some of the tips I've, I've picked up that help, might help improve your scaling results are first, to take pictures of your static pose, of your subject during static pose. And this is what I was talking about earlier. I think it's really important to take, at least take a snapshot of how your subject was standing during the static pose. So that way when you're doing, you're performing scale, and you're looking at the scaled model in the OpenSim GUI, you kind of have a sanity check or a point of reference to see that you're appropriately, appropriately scaling your model. It's also a good idea to maybe uh, measure your subject's segment length. Um, I've done an experiment with uh, my co-author, AJ Seth. He has freakishly long tibias. And, uh, and if, we didn't, if we hadn't measured um, his body segments, we, would, you know, we wouldn't have known that his tibias actually had a much larger scale factor than the rest of the bones uh, in his body. Uh, developing a standard marker set will just make your life easier um, so that you don't have to keep recreating virtual marker sets every time you want to do uh, your analysis. And finally, if you have... Uh, if, you if you can, and one of the things I've started doing is calculating functional joint centers. So during my experiment, I actually have each of my subjects do functional movements um, for the hip, knee, ankle, and shoulders so that I can calculate where these joint centers are, and that helps make my scaling more accurate and, and easier to do. Once we have a scaled model, we move on to inverse kinematics, or IK for short. Here we're going to calculate the joint angles of the scaled model that best match the marker data we collected during our experiment. 
The screenshot here shows a snapshot of the IK solution from the running simulation. Notice that there are two sets of markers around the model. The green, if you look in real close, you can see the green one. The green markers, that's the virtual marker set that I mentioned in the scale step. And then the blue markers are the measured or experimental markers from our, our experiment. IK finds the joint angles of the model that minimize the error between these two sets of markers. Some tips for getting uh, consistent I, IK results are, again, using a uh, standard marker set will just make your life easier. Uh, it's always a good idea to place three markers, three non-collinear markers or three markers that aren't in a straight line per body segment that you're trying to track the motion of. You need three, three non-collinear markers so that you can tra accurately track both position and orientation of a body in space. Finally, uh, place markers on landmarks with um, minimal skin movement. So um, the thigh is typically a, um, a body segment that doesn't have that, that has a lot of skin motion, has a lot of muscle motion. So typically I try to place two markers along the IT band, which tends not to move around as much as say the quads or the hamstring. So I try to try to pick points on the body that, that, will, that will minimize the skin movement. Okay, so our next step is to, is to determine the joint torques that were required to drive the model through, through the motion that we calculated in IK. We call, we call this step residual reduction algorithm, or RRA. You can think of RRA as kind of like traditional inverse dynamics and the fact that we're actually calculating joint torques. And this is where we're, we're going to use the measured ground reaction force data that we collected in the lab. But RRA performs an additional step to minimize what we call the residual force and moment. These are non-physical forces and moments that are applied to the base segment of a model which in our case is the pelvis, in order to maintain dynamic consistency, or in other words, to obey Newton's third law of F equals MA. These residuals are due to measurement and modeling errors and can be quite large when we just do inverse dynamics up to one half body weight for this running simulation. And th these residuals are here in inverse dynamics even if you don't calculate them or if your software package doesn't tell you about them, they're still there. But with slide adjustments, uh, but so RA is able to make slide adjustments to the joint kinematics and model mass properties and minimize these residuals. And for this simulation, we were able to get the residuals to under 10 newtons. Some tips for RA when you're using this tool is first, you're gonna to need to realize that it will take multiple iterations to get, to get good results. You're not, um, unfortunately, you're not just gonna push a button and get, and get great RA results. So you're gonna to have to run, run the tool look at your residuals, look at your joint angle errors, and, and refine your settings so that you can get a good, good dynamically consistent uh, simulation. The goal, the goal of the simulation is to, is to minimize the residuals without having significant changes in the joint angle. So you're kind of playing a balance game of how much you are going, you're allowing the joint angles to change versus how low you want your residuals to be. And as a rule of thumb, I always try to make sure that the, the RMS difference or the root mean square difference between the joint angles that I calculated in IK and the joint angles that come out of RA, that RMS difference should be less than two degrees. So a little known fact, once you've actually completed RA, you have what we call a forward dynamic simulation. The only thing is, is that this simulation is driven by joint torques, not by muscles. And we're interested in muscle forces. So if we want to know what muscle, which muscle forces drive the simulation to produce this motion, we have to do one more step. And we call that computed muscle control, or CMC. CMC takes the dynamically consistent output that we got from RRA and predicts the muscle forces that drive the simulation. Because we have multiple muscles spanning each joint in the model, which is sometimes called uh, actuator redundancy, CMC uses a static optimization criteria to determine how the forces are distributed among the muscles. But CMC doesn't just stop there. CMC also uses a PD or proportional derivative controller to adjust and make sure the predicted muscle forces will produce the motion uh, that we measured in the lab. So in other words, if we just use static optimization to predict the muscle forces and use those results to create a forward simulation, we would actually see a large difference in the motion generated. So by utilizing a PD controller, CMC makes sure that the predicted muscle forces will actually produce the movement that we're trying to analyze. 
Okay, so we've worked hard. We've made multiple, oops, I skipped some of the steps. Sorry, I'm gonna go back. I skipped the steps, uh, tips and tricks for CMC. So again, some tips for CMC. Uh, again, like RA, it requires multiple iterations. One of the things that's, that's not totally exposed in CMC is the fact that we actually have um, what we call reserve torques on, on the model as well. So sometimes the muscles cannot generate enough torque to produce the motion that we measured in the lab. So we have these, these reserve torques at each of the degrees of freedom that, that help us get a solution from CMC. But we don't want, these are non-physical torques, so we're trying to also minimize these torques as much as possible. So that's kind of the goal of adjusting your settings in CMC. Additionally, if you're getting muscle activations that don't match uh, your EMG that we me you measured in the lab, and I'll talk about that in a bit, um, there, are there are control constraints that you can use to help improve uh, your predicted activations. Okay, so I got ahead of myself. I was excited. We've done a lot of hard work. We've iterated through RA and CMC a couple times. And once we've gone through the workflow, we produce this, this final result. This is a visualization of the simulated muscle activations for our measured motion. This is a, this is a, run, a running gait cycle. The figure is showing the gait cycle from left foot strike to subsequent left foot strike. And the muscle colors are showing you the muscle activation patterns from fully activated in red to no muscle activity in blue. So you can see kind of here in mid stance, I'm gonna highlight it all in green, um, that the hamstrings are turned on really, uh, they're really bright red. And then as we go towards toe off over here on the bottom, you can see that uh, the plantar flexors are turning red as they're firing um, to push us forward and toe off. Okay, so we're gonna stop. We're gonna take a break real quick and, and have another poll. I'm interested to see how people have used other techniques um, to predict muscle activations and forces. So the question is, which methods have you used to estimate muscle forces and activation? activations? A, static optimization. B, computed muscle control. C, dynamic optimization. D, optimal control. E, some other method that I haven't heard of. F, I don't estimate muscle forces, but I wish I could. Or G, who cares about muscle forces? Uh, and if you, if you pick E, other, um, fill in, specify the technique that you use and let us know. All right, Webex is crunching away at our poll results. All right, so we have we have a nice spread here. Um, about 20, um, one quarter of you said you don't currently uh, estimate muscle forces, but you wish you could. We have about 20% who use static optimization, 20% who've used computed muscle control, 12% use dynamic optimization, and a few uh, a few people have used optimal control, and a few others, but I don't get to see the what they specified. Oh well. Okay, so before we can move on to analyzing the results from that simulation, we need to we need to take a few steps to make sure we have confidence that the simulation is accurate. To do that, we need to compare to previous data if it's available. Luckily, luckily for us, lots of other researchers have studied running. So I was able to, com to compare the joint angles, joint moments, and ground reaction forces from the simulation to data from the literature. If you take a close look at the simulated results, the simulated results are the, the solid white lines. They fall within the range of data from previous studies. And while this doesn't guarantee that we've created an accurate model, it does provide us with a good sanity check that we have we're analyzing uh, stereotypical gait patterns. Additionally, we're very, we're very interested in muscle forces. So we pay particular attention to the muscle activation patterns that are predicted by computed muscle control. 
since we can't actually measure muscle, muscle force, forces, we do the next best thing, which is to compare experimentally measured EMG data with the simulated activation pattern. And here I'm showing experimental EMG data for four muscles, and that's uh, shown in gray. And then I'm showing the predicted uh, muscle activation patterns from computed muscle control. You can see that computed muscle control does a pretty good job with some of the uniarticular muscles, like vastus medialis, uh, during stance, it, it, it uh, matches very well the experimental EMG data. Same thing for soleus. And then you can see that for uh, some of the, the biarticular muscles, like gastroc, it does a pretty good job, but it, it doesn't do as well. We see some spikiness over here for gastroc. And we also see that for biceps femoris, in, at the end of the gait cycle, CMC doesn't predict this kind of pre-activation of the hamstrings before, before foot strike. So there are, you know, it's not perfect, but this is a pretty good match. Okay, we're almost there. We've, we've gone four fifths of our way uh, through for creating our simulation. We've developed the specific research question. We designed and conducted our experiments. We used OpenSim to create the simulation. We've tested the results to make sure uh, they're accurate. So now we need to analyze the results so that we can actually answer a question. We can do something compelling with this simulation. So that brings us back to the question. How do muscles contribute to propulsion and support of the body mass center during running? To answer this question, we need to determine how do estimated muscle forces contribute to the acceleration of the body mass center? To do that, we can use one of two analyses that come with OpenSim. One is called an induced acceleration analysis, and the other is called a perturbation analysis. These are two very similar analyses that decompose the equations of motion to solve for muscle contributions to mass center or joint acceleration. But the main difference in these two methods is how the foot floor interaction is, is modeled. And that difference could actually be an entire webinar on its own. But basically, each analysis will calculate how the muscle forces produced by how each individual muscle force in the model contributes to acceleration. The results, I'm showing the results here, um, which we calculated using an induced acceleration analysis. Um, the results show, uh, these plots show the three main contributors to braking, propulsion, and support during running, which are the quadriceps, uh, which are the uh, muscles on the front of your thigh, and then the ankle plantar flexors, or gastrocnemius and soleus, which are the, uh, your calf muscles. During early stance, as the foot hits the ground, the quads really uh, work to break the mass center. Then as the body starts to accelerate forward in mid stance, we see that gastroc and soleus are, uh, are leaning to the right, meaning that they're uh, accelerating the mass center forward. Once we have these kind of results, we can also we can begin to make in interesting comparisons, like looking at how muscles function during walking and running. Muscle contributions to propulsion and support for our subject were very similar to muscle contributions reported for fast walking in another study from our lab by uh, Lou et al. in 2008. During early stance, both simulations revealed that the quadriceps decreased forward speed of the body mass center and provided body weight support. During mid to late stance, both simulations showed that the soleus and gastroc are the primary contributors to propulsion and support. These results suggest that muscles play very similar roles in accelerating the body mass center during walking and running. Finally, I also wanted to point out that one of the, one of the other great aspects of OpenSim is the ability to extend upon existing tools to create your own custom analyses. So when we started modeling running dynamics, we were very interested in learning how the arms would affect, uh, would affect the motion, would affect the dynamics. But our results from the induced acceleration analysis showed us that arms contributed essentially nothing to propulsion and support of the body mass center. But we knew other researchers had examined angular momentum of arm movement. So I was able to actually take the OpenSim API and create an analysis to calculate angular momentum of each of the body segments during the simulation. And an inter interesting result came out of that. If we added up the vertical component of the angular momentum of all the body segments, I'm sorry, of all the arm segments, the angular momentum of the arms almost 
exactly equal, uh, was almost exactly equal and opposite that of a leg segment. And that's shown here in the plot on the bottom right, where we can see the, the arms, the vertical angular momentum of the arms in the dashed line, and then the vertical angular momentum of the legs in the solid white line. This suggests, just suggests to us that arms play an important role in counterbalancing the movement of the legs as the legs are acting to propel the body forward and support the body's weight during running. Okay, and one last shameless plug for uh, my simulation and paper. If you're interested in learning more about the study or checking out the simulation yourself, you can download uh, the results and load them into OpenSim. Just visit our project at simtk.org slash home slash running sim. Oh yeah, and, and I just wanted to acknowledge, um, first I wanted to acknowledge the organizers of the webinar, Joy Koo and Jen Hicks. They've done a lot of work behind the scenes uh, to make this webinar happen. And then also uh, all of my lab mates and collaborators here at Stanford and um, uh, my funding and support. Okay, thank you, Sam, for a great talk. Now we're gonna begin the question and answer portion. Um, to start, please note that if you downloaded our instructions last week, there's a slight change in format. Uh, so for the audio questions, uh, you must have a, a functioning microphone to ask an audio question. And if you want to ask a question, go to the participant box at the top right and then click on the ask for mic button or the image of a microphone if you have a, a Mac. A number will then appear next uh, on your bike icon next to your name in the participant list. Uh, and when we call on you, you'll see a pop-up window asking if you want to unmute your mic, hit OK, and then you'll be able to ask your question. Uh, you can also ask, test, ask text questions by going to the Q&A box at the bottom right. Uh, make sure that you're asking all panelists uh, Then type in your question in the bottom of the box. Again, make sure so we can see your question that it goes to all panelists. Uh, and now we're going to open up to questions. Okay, we're getting lots of questions coming in. Uh, first, uh, Sarah, Sarah and Kaya. Uh, I'm not sure uh, I'm about, not the sure about the pronunciation. My apologies. Oops. Okay, he asked, what is the relationship between muscle forces and EMG data? Uh, is there a proportional constant? So we model, um, the way we model muscle forces, we actually have uh, muscle models that take um, an input signal, which we call excitation, and there's a first order delay, and we get muscle activation, and then the muscle model, the force generated by the muscle model is dependent upon that activation, the length of the muscle fibers, and the velocity of the muscle fibers. Um, so. There's some debate as to should you compare EMG, is EMG representative of these excitations that we use in the muscle model or the activations? Um, we, we tend to compare them to the activations, but there's no direct, um, there's no direct proportion between the experimentally measured EMG and the predicted muscle activation. The computed muscle control knows nothing about the measured EMG signals when it's computing uh, or it's when it's predicting the, the simulated muscle activations. So this is something we do, we compare after the fact, just, just to make sure um, that we're predicting something that, kind of, that, that makes sense to us. Hopefully that answered your question. Okay, so the next question from Tom Erez asks, would you tell us more about how you modeled the ground interaction? Did you use a hybrid model, a spring mesh? So yeah, so, as I mentioned, that that could be an entire webinar on itself, um, modeling contact. But we, for the induced acceleration analysis, um, we actually used a rigid body constraint, and um, you can use different types of rigid body constraints. In the previous literature, people have used welds or pin joints um, to model the foot floor interaction. But we actually designed our uh, a custom constraint that we call a rolling on surface, a rolling without slipping constraint. Um, to model the foot floor interaction. And that's just a kinematic constraint between the foot and the floor. Now the perturb perturbation analysis 
it uses a screen damper element to model the foot floor interaction. And the, the, the difference there is that you actually have to perform small forward, small forward integrations at each time step in the analysis. So the perturbation tool is actually about 100 times slower than the induced acceleration analysis. And we've actually been showing that we're getting much better um, results from the induced acceleration analysis with this rolling without sleeping constraint than we were able to get from the perturbation analysis. Um, and by better, I mean, um, we call it the principle of superposition. We take the individual contributions from each of the muscles to the mass center acceleration, sum those together, and that should equal or ma closely match the measured mass center acceleration that we got from the motion capture data. So hopefully that, that kind of gets to your question, Tom. Okay, so now we're going to go to an audio question. I am going to pass the mic to Tom Lintern. And we'll give you a couple seconds, Tom, to unmute your mic. Are you there? We'll give you a little more time. Okay, we're going to try someone else. Okay, we're going to, how about Mary Line? Uh, hello? Hello? Okay. Uh, we're having a little trouble with the audio. Uh, so we'll go to another text question. Uh, so Mohammed Sharif asks, have you considered the delay within activation dynamics in your model? And if yes, how? Um, so I guess I was kind of, that's kind of what I was talking about. Um, when I was saying we, we have an input signal that goes into the muscle model, and then there are spring um, and uh, spring elements in the muscle model that cause a first order delay um, from the excitation to the activation. And then there are, there are activation and deactivation time constants within those um, differential equations that model that delay. So um, hopefully that, that's what you're talking about. Well, when you talk about the activation, uh, the delay within activation dynamics. Okay, so now we're going to give the audio question one more go. I'm going to pass the mic to Wei Lu. Hello. Okay, next question. Hello, Wei Lu? Okay, we can hear you. Hello? Okay. Um, we're having some difficulties with the audio questions, so uh, we're going to just go with text questions. Um, so the next question from Bob Cargo, how, how could OpenSIM be used to model balance on an accelerating platform? That's a good question. Um, we're actually, there's some people in our lab who are, who are doing some experiments like this where they're trying to develop controllers that predict muscle activations during a postural balance task. So they, um, they, they've come up with some interesting strategies to how to predict muscle activation. So they don't, they're not doing the same exact simulation workflow that I described here where they measure the postural motion and then use computed muscle control. They're not doing that. They actually have come up with their own control, control um, strategy to, to keep the center of mass kind of um, within the center of the base of support of the model. And they, they are able to, they have a platform body, and they're able to apply force to that platform, which is like, which simulates kind of the platform experiments that are done. That are done. And then we're able to see how the model reacts to 
to keep the center of mass over the basic support. Um, so that that's just one way that you might be able to do those kinds of do those kinds of experiments. Another interesting thing, this kind of actually gets back to Tom Arez's question earlier, is that we are we are also able to OpenSim is able to use different uh, models of contact. So we we're, the other interesting thing about this study is that they have um, meshes of of the the people's feet and they have um, an object that represents the platform. So we're able to calculate how the model is um, adjusting its center of pressure as well as how it's controlling its center of mass location uh, with respect to these perturbations on the platform. Okay, so the next question from Becky Fallon. Uh, she asked, for your running simulation, she didn't see a comparison of joint reaction forces one calculates in RRA and what is obtained from inverse dynamics. Did you make this comparison, and did you find the forces were similar? Um, Becky, do you mean uh, joint? Do you mean uh, residual forces? Because yeah, in my study, I didn't look at joint reaction forces, um, and I don't think there's any experimental data to compare joint reaction forces during running two. But if you meant uh, the residual forces, uh, there's actually a graph in the append uh, in the supplemental material where I did make that comparison, and the vertical residual force um, in inverse dynamics was about 300 newtons, or one half the body weight of the subject. And after RRA, with um, less than two degrees, like I was talking about earlier, less than two degrees of RMS difference in the joint angle, we were able to get that down to less than 10 newtons. The residual moments, they're a little bit harder to get to be as low, and so, um, I think they started at about 100 newton meters, and we were able to get them down to about 30, a peak of 30 newton meters. Um, and it's actually interesting. I thought that the hardest uh, residual to minimize was going to be the vertical residual moment, uh, kind of um, the twisting. You can kind of think of that as a twisting moment. Um, but it was actually the the tilt the tilt moment, kind of what pitches the body forward and backward, which, which was the hardest. Um, residual to, to get it to minimize. Okay, so next question from Mary Lyon Vandercroat. She asked, was the generic model strong enough to run, or did you have to increase the muscle strength? That's a good question, Mary Lyon. Um, that, happens, that happens a lot that people have to increase the strength of these models, but um, I was actually able to generate the simulation with, without increasing the strength of the model and with minimal um, reserve torques. So the model was strong enough to, gen to generate this uh, running, this subject's running gait cycle. But I do know that others have had to look at strengthening the muscles to uh, generate different movements, especially things that have high forces like a run and cut or something like that. Um, I also could give a plug for a new model that's been developed in our lab. Uh, one of my colleagues, Edith Arnold, has just published a paper um, or published a model with a much richer, based on a much richer data set of uh, from a cadaver study, and they did a much better job at um, looking at the joint angle fiber length relationships. So um, you can start to do studies to look at fiber length during motion. But they also um, saw that the plantar flexors and some of the other major muscle groups were a bit stronger than the muscle than the muscle parameters that came from the DELT model. Okay, next question from Natalie Holt. Uh, is there any way you can incorporate stretch, stretch activation of muscle to try and get the model to predict the activation of muscle before foot strike? Yeah, um, yeah, so it, it would take a bit of work. You, you would have to learn kind of how to use the OpenSim API, but you could definitely implement a controller like that. And um, I do think, and going back to that study on the platform, um, the platform perturbations, I do think that that they have been playing around with um, kind of a stretch reflex controller where they look at the fiber velocity of each of the muscles and um, turn on the muscles or predict an activation based on that, uh, that fiber velocity or, or muscle stretch. So th there are ways that you could actually do that. Okay, somewhat related question from Vikas Call. 
key athletes the orientation and or constitution of fibers, for example, slow versus fast twitch, taken into account in the muscle model? So, yeah, we don't, so for the slow twitch versus fast twitch, we don't model the difference between muscle fiber types, but we do um, model the orientation or the, we call it the pination angle of the muscle fibers. So that is taken into account um, in our muscle model, but yeah, we don't, we don't differentiate between fast type and slow type. Uh, okay, let's see what's next. And I guess, I don't know, uh, just to, to elaborate on that a little bit more, um, it's important to remember that in, when you're using your model, what kind of question you're trying to answer. So here we're trying to just look at how muscle forces generate motion. So it's not really important for, for this study, uh, I don't know if it's important is the right word, but we don't necessarily need to model you know, slow versus fast twitch um, muscle if, we're, if we think we're getting decent estimations of muscle force. So you could argue that, you know, if we had a model that had slow twitch, fast twitch muscle fibers, we might get better force predictions. But if we think we're getting decent muscle force predictions with the current model, there's no need to cre increase the complexity of the muscle model. That's kind of my philosophy. <laughs> okay, next from M Melissa Daly, uh, were torques used to drive the arm action? And how big were they? That's good. Uh, I didn't talk about the arms at all. So yes, I did use torque, torque actuators to drive the arm dynamics to track the motion. Um, and I can tell you that I, I don't I don't know the raw numbers off the top of my head, but the order of magnitude was in, you know, was in like 20 to to 50 newton meters or something like that. Um, but I didn't. I don't have a a good com uh, chart or comparison to, to show you that data right now. Okay, we have time for a few more questions. Uh, Graham Caldwell asks, how sensitive are your final results to the parameters that have been chosen for RRA and CMC? Yeah, um, I don't have, I can't give you a, a solid quantified answer of how the, what the sensitivity of the results are, but I, you know, I've done, I did do a lot of different uh, iterations on the simulation, looking at how different parameters affected the results. And I would say that the results from RRA are, are kind of what the parameters that you put into RRA are going to affect your results more than CMC um, in the fact that you can, you can change the joint angles that you're tr um, going to track to, to Zare adjusts the joint angles to make a dynamic, dynamically consistent um, simulation. So I think the parameters in RRA are going, going to affect your results the most. So if you change your parameters and you see large changes from the output of RRA, that's going to affect your results the most. Sorry, it's not a super clear answer, but. OK. Uh, next from Jason Franz. Uh, to follow up on one of the earlier questions, why would you need to scale the model's muscle strength at all? Uh, does this reflect the model's development from cadaver data? Yeah, that's a good question, Jason. So while we do, when we scale our model, we also scale the muscle, the muscles as well. But we only are, we are only scaling the muscle tendon length, and we scale the, we also scaled muscle fiber and tendon links within the muscle tendon unit to maintain uh, the ratio of muscle to tendon that was in the generic model. But when we scale the model, we don't change um, the force capacity of the mu muscles. So, um, and I, so if you're scaling your model to match, you know, some really big, strong dude, he's not, you're, the, the muscle forces aren't going to increase when you scale the model. So some people have, have noticed that for motions that have high accelerations and high forces, they actually have to increase the, mus the optimal muscle force of each of the, the muscles in the model to be able to, for, to generate the torques that are necessary to, to drive the model to that motion. Hopefully that makes sense, Jason. Okay, so next from John Goodwin, uh, he asked, did you use a one degree of freedom knee 
and in that case are the reserve torques used to equilibrate non-sagittal, what are, I think, the reserve torques used to equilibrate non-sagittal plane rotation? Um, so we use a one degree of freedom model, but it's a cup, it has coupled uh, translations with the rotation of the knee. So it, it does it does model the the translation that you see um, in the in knee motion as well as the knee rotation. So it's kind of you get these two these two these two movements as one de as uh, one degree of freedom. We call that a, um, uh, a coupler. We actually use a coupler constraint to to constrain those two motions to be driven by one degree of freedom. Um, and then the second part of the question. Was were the reserve torques? What? what are uh, okay, so no, so the reserve torques, um, and I guess I should explain these. The reserve torques are you can kind of imagine them as motors at each of the uh, degrees of freedom that we have modeled. So the reserve torque would help um, in knee flexion and extension, but it doesn't do anything to mitigate to kind of um, represent the forces in varus valgus or internal external rotation of the knee. Um, and these are actually encapsulated kind of in the what we call the joint reaction forces. So if I wanted to know um, how my knee is doing in modeling varus valgus, I could look at the joint reaction um, of, of the knee, of that knee model and and compare to you know what I get from inverse dynamics if I opened up that degree of freedom. So it's the non-sagittal um, forces are made up in the joint reaction or the um, the way the, the knee is um, constrained, not by the reserve torques. Okay, and we have time for one more question uh, from Marcus Salbum uh, related to the research results. Which was the muscle most responsible for propulsion? Uh, it was gastroc and soleus, about equally. So it was the plantar flexors. Those were, um, for this subject, at a single speed, single step, that was the most. Those were the. Uh, that was the most important muscle for propulsion. Um, I'm actually conducting a study now to look at a range of running speeds. It'll be interesting to see if these results um, stay the same over multiple subjects and multiple speeds. Um, but it, I think it makes a lot of sense that it's the the plantar flexors are the main contributors to propulsion. Oh, and I should also mention this person was running at a four meters per second, which is about six and a half, six forty minute per mile pace, if any of you guys are runners out there. Okay, great. Um, thank you for all your questions. I'm sorry that we weren't able to get them all, but we can address those uh, offline via uh, email after the presentation. Um, we also thank you for participating in the first OpenSIM webinar. Sorry for those technical difficulties with the audio questions. Uh, we'd ask that you complete the informational survey that's going to appear in a pop-up window at the conclusion of the seminar. This will help us improve the webinars and select topics for upcoming webinars. Uh, also, a recording of the webinar will be available on our OpenSIM website later this week. Um, we're planning future webinars in the coming months that we hope you'll join us for. Uh, the first will be related to estimating joint loads in OpenSIM. Uh, next, to acknowledge our funding source, uh, sources. OpenSIM and this webinar series are supported by several grants from the NIH and EU. Uh, in particular, we have an NIH grant that funds our National Center for Simulation and Rehabilitation Research. Uh, so thank you again uh, for, for participating. Uh, please fill out the survey and check out our new website at opensim.stanford.edu and we hope that you'll continue to stay involved with the OpenSIM community. Thank you.